Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate, or you can go to buy me a cup of coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by, with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you, and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20 plus, you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, canadaehx.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. The land that Atacocan sits on was inhabited by the indigenous for millennia, long before Europeans ever arrived. The primary indigenous group was the Ojibwe Chippewa, and the name of the area and the community itself comes from them for the word caribou bones or caribou crossing. At the current town site, the caribou would often winter and it was here that many were hunted by the indigenous to provide them with meat through the cold season. Nearby to Atacokan, there are many indigenous rock paintings and the lake names also attest to the indigenous history of the area. One such lake is Windagustagon and it's well worth a visit to check out. In 1688, Jacques de Nayon became the first European to meet the indigenous of the area. Thanks to him, the exploration of the area would increase, but it would not happen quickly. The next explorer was Le Vey André, who arrived in 1731 and would open up the area to the fur trade. By 1741, French fur traders were common in the area and competing against the powerful Hudson's Bay Company. By the end of the century, in 1798, Roderick Mackenzie came to the area, following the route of Levee André, and establishing a network of fur trading posts for the Northwest Company in the area. The fur trade history of the area would slowly decline through the 19th century, but something else would come along to aid settlement, the Dawson Trail. Construction of the Dawson Trail began to the west of the present community in 1868, one year after Canada became a country. It would take another six years before the trail was done, although it would be used by the government to transport Colonel Wolseley and his troops to Winnipeg to fight in the Red River resistance. The trail started in Thunder Bay and moved west towards Winnipeg. It had several different routes, but the current Highway 11 that connects Atacokan with Thunder Bay follows parts of that old trail. The same year that the Dawson Trail was completed, J. Baptist and M. Prishat of the Hudson's Bay Company discovered gold southwest of the community at Jackfish Lake. This would become an influential moment not only for the mining history of Atacokan, but also the local indigenous. Chief Blackstone prevented an attempt to build a mine for the gold in 1872, and he would negotiate the Northwest Angle Treaty, which would cede the land to Canada and create the reserves in the area. Chief Blackstone would pass away during the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, and today is buried at Angus Lake. Today, Atacokan sits on Treaty 3 land. The history of the Dawson Trail would be short when it was superseded in 1882 with the construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway that passed through the area north of the community. In 1897, William McInnes, a geologist, came to the area and revealed the potential for iron ore. The first thing most noticed in the area was the potential for timber, not iron though. The first attempt to harvest timber occurred in 1886, and this would prove to be an important industry for the area until mining began to take over in the mid-20th century. By 1899, the Canadian Northern Railway would lay out a town site that would become Matacokan. Despite the town site being laid out, the community was little more than a bush settlement until the 1940s when iron ore spurred on the development of the area. 
The same year that the town site was laid out, Tom and Mary Ron became the first residents of European descent. The hope of finding gold had brought the couple to the area, and with the rumors of a divisional point would be built in the area, Tom would build the Pioneer Hotel. This hotel had 18 rooms to accommodate the few people who came to the region to stake a claim. Speaking of staking claims, Tom Ron was the first person to do so for iron ore in the area. The history of Atacokan has a lot to do with the mining industry and a few places in Canada mined on the scale of Atacokan. This was all thanks to Steep Rock Lake. The lake had been carved by the glaciers thousands of years ago, leaving ridges of water with exposed outcrops of iron. There was speculation by 1885 of mining in the area, but the lake made it difficult to access the iron ore. First arriving in 1926 and then in 1937 and 1938, Julian Cross located a major ore body under the lake. Cross was famous for finding a silver mine in the Thunder Bay area, and he was known for not using modern technology and would often travel around with a canoe, backpack, and a pick. Cross and Joe Arrington came into partnership to make the initial drilling possible and to prove that iron ore was under the lake. The iron ore was not flat along the lake. There are fault lines that run through, including the Samuel Fault Line, and that meant the iron ore was broken up and in chunks because the lake is an M shape. Morrison Scarth Fotheringham knew Arrington, and he ended up at Steep Rock Lake. He was a mastermind in one of Canada's great engineering mines, and this would lead him to becoming an important figure in the project to follow. To take advantage of the abundance of ore, Steep Rock Iron Mines was formed one year later, but getting to the ore was not easy due to flooding in the mine. Another company formed that operated on the lake was Kaland Ore, which combined Canada with inland steel to create the name. A small shaft was sunk to 1,400 feet below the lake level. The sinking of the shaft went well, but before long it became impossible to get the water out. It may have ended there, but the Second World War was beginning, and the demand for ore was extremely high. To that end, Pop Fotheringham was brought in in 1941 to divert the river system to prevent it from flowing into Steep Rock Lake. This began one of the most amazing engineering projects in the history of Canada, and even North America. For Tom Ron, his claims would suddenly become very profitable, and he would sell 109 claims to the Midwest Iron Mining Corporation. He then created Ron Iron Mines Incorporated using his 60 remaining claims. Sadly, soon after, he went out prospecting and never returned. His body was never found. The diversion of the lake and the draining of the lake was a bold plan. It was so immense that there was skepticism in the United States. Two consultants, two of the top geologists and engineers at the time, verified the work of the men and that became the basis for going ahead with the river diversion. It took about a year to do it working around the clock and they had to build several roads into the area. The work to divert the river system involved removing 110 million yards of silt, gravel and rock, taking 270 million tons of the lake bottom out. This project moved more earth than the Panama Canal and it did so in just half the time. The amount of water pumped out in 8 hours was enough to supply all of Montreal with water for an entire day. In one single week, the amount of earth moved was the same amount excavated to make the Young Street subway in Toronto. The work to get the lake drained to access the ore was worth it. By 1949, 1 million tons of ore per year was being extracted. Two mining companies would operate out of the mines for the next three decades, the aforementioned Steep Rock Iron Mines and the Calland Ore Company. The amount of high-grade ore pulled out from the pits at the bottom of Steep Rock Lake was enough to produce every single steel part in every automobile ever driven in Canada up to 1970. And by the time the mines closed in the 1970s, over 90 million tons of ore had been extracted from the mines. While there was enough ore to keep the mines in use for upwards of 100 years, taconite, a new iron ore, was being used more in the 1970s. This made the ore from the mines less economical, and by the 1980s, the mines had closed. The mines may not have lasted long, but they allowed the current community of Atacokan to become the place it is today. The Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce soon arrived in the community, while roads were quickly built to the community. By 1950, 3,000 people were living in Atacokan. With this rapid growth, lots in the community quickly began to skyrocket in price. What originally cost $10 per acre soon became $100 per square foot. A lot on Main Street bought for $300 in 1949 would cost $28,000 by 1954. 
And that year, Atacokan was also incorporated as a town. I'll talk more about the changing face of Atacokan at this time later in the episode. In 1921, an epic story of travel reached the world concerning the story of Dr. Graham Chalmers. On September 29th, Chalmers, who was a doctor from Toronto, disappeared in the bush outside the community about 40 kilometers to the northwest. He had been on a fishing trip when he became lost while with his nephew, who had left the bush to attend to other matters. When he returned, he found his uncle gone. A search party was sent out to find the doctor, and the weather was terrible as winter was beginning to settle in. Two indigenous men were part of the search party, and after 13 days, they would find Dr. Chalmers by following tracks made by the rubber studs in his boots. When he was found, he had no matches and was holding a dead partridge. During his 13 days lost in the bush, Dr. Chalmers had no food or fire. And when he was found, the searchers did everything they could to keep him comfortable for the night, and the next day took him to Fort Francis, where he would board a train dispatched by the Canadian National Railway to be taken home to recover. Upon arriving home, he was greeted by his wife and was well on his way to recovering. Today, smallpox has been eradicated from the planet. For the past 40 years, no human has ever contracted the disease, but there was a time that it was one of the worst diseases in history. It's estimated to have killed upwards of 300 million people from 1900 to 1977, while decimating the indigenous populations during the 1600s to the 1800s. Back in January 1926, Anacokin was the site of a smallpox outbreak that had many on edge. What was thought to be a minor outbreak quickly became very serious when two people died and case numbers began to increase in the community. There have been several vaccinations in the community and strict isolation of cases, but it was still spreading. Along with the two dead, there were seven infected that were known about. The people in isolation were also in contact with trappers and lumber camps before they even knew they were infected. It was believed that this strain of smallpox came to the community because of a drifter named Rambling Johnson. Johnson worked at several lumber camps for a few days and visited various trappers. The Winnipeg Tribune reported, quote, The small town of Atacokan is terror-stricken at the outbreak. Most of the citizens have been vaccinated, and every stranger arriving there is looked upon with suspicion until he is seen by a doctor. The story of the smallpox outbreak also brought about a hero named Al Smith. He was a trapper and prospector when the epidemic hit. News of a man hit by smallpox reached the town, but no one could get to him, and all anyone knew was what the woodsmen who came in told them. Smith had just arrived in the community, and he realized that it was his friend who was sick. He set off to find his friend and found him delirious and sick. Smith watched over his friend for ten days with barely any rest. Sadly, even though he was there with his friend, the story ends tragically when Smith's friend passed away shortly after medical help arrived. A coffin was brought into the shack where Smith dug a grave and served as the only mourner for his friend. In 1935, Atacokin left enough of an impression on poet C.D. Lang that he would write of the glories of the community. He would write one poem stating, quote, We sing a lay without a blush of Atacokin in the bush. We could not love thee any more, O beauteous town by Schrider's store. So we have busted into song to let the gaping gang along, along with the whole blamed CNR get wise to what we have in our, end quote. During a railway strike in August 1950, Anacokin was completely cut off from the rest of the country, and that created a very serious problem. Food supplies were quickly running out and the only bakery in town had exhausted all of its yeast supplies. At the time, there was no road outlet and no regular air service. By August 24th, it was estimated that within four days, the food supplies of the community would be completely gone. The community appealed to the strike committee of the Canadian National Railway for a mercy train to be sent out. The town put in an order for 250 cases of milk and the federal government was asked to send in a Royal Canadian Air Force amphibious plane. D. Wright, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, would say, quote, They'll send out 15 planes to look for one person who gets lost in the woods. Well, there are 3,000 of us lost in the woods here. End quote. Two days before the community ran out of food, a relief train filled with 40 tons of food arrived in the community. As soon as the train arrived, 150 people ran to the station to collect supplies. The boxcar and refrigerator cars were put on siding, and the locomotive and caboose returned to the lakehead. Within one of the refrigeration cars, there was 800 gallons of fresh milk. And with the train were union officials who ensured conditions under which the striking organization sanctioned the emergency trip were not violated. During the boom years of Atacokan, during the 1950s as the mines were bringing in many new residents, 
the community was changing every day. While the thought of a boomtown brings up images of a rough and tough place, Anacokan didn't have that trend. The Kingston Week Standard reported in July 1954, quote, There's no whiskey. If any gambling exists, it certainly is invisible. Nearly all the women are married and busy raising families. And when two trucks driven by husky young men reached out of Koken's main intersection at the same time, I saw each driver politely wave on the other. End quote. While the community only had 300 people in the early 1940s, it was reaching 5,500 people in 1954, with expectations it could reach 30,000 people by 1960. At the time, Atacokan had the highest birth rate of any community in Canada, with 42 per 1,000 people. To accommodate this, a wing costing $130,000 was added to the hospital, with half being paid for by the government and the other half coming from the community. We delivered in, in 1959 and 60. We had 325 babies in 59 and 326 in the next year. By that time, Dr. Grayson was here and Dr. Wilson. But we sure, we had the highest birth rate in Canada by far for two years in a row. I had five in one day myself. The community was also looking for teachers and paying well for them. When one advertisement was placed in a Toronto newspaper, the community received 55 applications. In 1965, there were 2,000 children in the community attending five public schools and one separate school. In the high school, there were 450 students. In 1957, Atacokin would join the space race thanks to a group of teenagers who decided to create the Atacokin Rocket Club. By March 1957, the members of the club had fired four rockets into the air, and the boys in the club had built a laboratory in the basement of Ron Ayton's house, and they built the rockets without the sanction of the school. The local police would give permission for the experiments, as long as the boys were conducting them at least one mile from town. The boys would don lab coats and safety goggles, and their rockets consisted of steel tubes about three feet long. Due to the fact that Atacokin is on the edge of the Ontario wilderness, with over 600 lakes within only a few hours' drive, there are plenty of opportunities for canoeing. Add in the nearby provincial park, and it comes as no surprise that Atacokin is the canoe capital of Canada. Around Atacokin, there is over 1 million acres of park, with 2,000 backcountry campsites and canoeing is a big part of living in the area. A morning paddle through the muddy waters of Atacokin can include seeing many bird species, moose and other mammals, and even a few reptiles depending on the time of year and time of day. Known as the Trail of the Voyageur, the community sits right along the canoe route taken by French explorers who traveled west to the Mississippi River and then south to the Gulf of Mexico. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Atacokan, then the best place to check out is the Atacokan Museum. In the museum, we will learn the history of the community dating back to its geological history that played a role in making Atacokan an iron ore boomtown. From there, through organized self-guided tours and excellent exhibits, you will learn about the indigenous, boomtown, and mining history of the community. Only a portion of the museum's artifacts are on display, but this creates an ever-changing exhibit that brings you something new on each visit. A historical park is located next to the museum via Footbridge, where you can visit outdoor exhibits of logging and mining equipment. The first artifact donated to the museum was the Shevlin Clark locomotive, and is now on display in the Heritage Park. It was dug out of the bush and completely refurbished. It was so heavy, trucks could not go over bridges, and it had to come in a special way to be placed in the park. There is also the Barrington Brake, an ore-crushing stamp mill, a logging raft capstan, and a dredge anchor. As well, throughout the town you can see large artifacts on display, which include descriptive labels. To view these locations, the best way, you should take the Atacokan walking tour. I hope you enjoyed that episode of my look at Atacokan. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter, my handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, 
Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.